Thank you. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, and I'd also like to thank the RSS and NFER for giving me this opportunity to speak. Take this. Um, so I'm Millie, um, and I've led the evaluation work of the Education Endowment Foundation since it was set up in 2011. As many of you know, as an organization, we're about the whole cycle of evidence. And later today, you're going to be hearing from Steve Higgins, who's going to be talking about the synthesis of our trials and also from Alex Quigley, who's going to be talking about how schools use our trials and our knowledge mobilization work. But I'll be spe specifically talking about the commissioning of trials. Now, I probably shouldn't admit this, but when I started at the EEF back in 2011, as the fifth um, employee eight years ago, I'd only ever attempted one RCT. And I realize now it wasn't that great. Now, when we started, I think we had this slightly naive idea that we would only commission gold standard RCTs, whatever that means, and that there'd be lots of people out there that we could talk to about it, which there were, but that they would have a really consistent and shared view about how to do that, um, which wasn't quite the case. Um, so as you can imagine, it's been a learning curve. Now, doing RCTs is not new, and doing RCTs in education certainly isn't new and hasn't been for 100 or maybe 88 years. <laughs> um, but I think what was new in 2011, in the UK at least, um, was the opportunity that came with a large pot of funding, 220 million pounds, and the pressure of quite a, t a short time scale in which to spend it, 15 years, and the determination to use that to build the evidence to tackle educational disadvantage. Now, since then, we're about halfway, just over halfway through, and we've just about spent over half um, the funding, so 114 million, on evaluations of teaching and learning programs, including 155 randomized control trials involving more than half the schools in England. It's been a journey. It's certainly been a journey for me but I think it's also been a journey that, um, to some extent, all of us, educators and evaluators, um, have been on together. And I'm very proud to be part of this community. We've had some great successes, and I'm going to talk about some of those, but we've also had some tough failures, and I'm going to talk about some of those as well. Uh, but we're a learning organization, and I wanted to use this opportunity to reflect on where we've come to, um, and also think about where we should go next. And also ask you, because we are a community, uh, what could we do different? And just on the, the sort of grammar side of things, I, I did reflect on whether it should be what we could do differently or what we could do different. And I think um, differently implies tweaking what you're already doing, whereas when you do something different, you're potentially doing something new. So I hope it conveys some open-minded or greater open-mindedness about where we could go next. So... Firstly, the successes. So RCTs are great. I think it's fair to say that currently um, we can say that they are the optimal or least biased approach for saying on average whether something works. And when combined with really high quality data on implementation and cost, provide powerful information for decision makers on what to uh, spend their budgets, in our case, head teachers. And I think that we should celebrate that we have proven that we can do this on a grand scale in education in the UK. Now, a big lesson for me has been that schools are willing to be randomized. And I think that's because we've been able to communicate the benefits. We've now recruited and randomized more than half the schools in England and over a million pupils. And we never would have predicted that eight years ago. I think we would have said it would be our biggest challenge. And secondly, I think we should celebrate that together we have done a lot to clarify what we mean by best practice and build capacity and capability to conduct education RCTs and also raise standards. This has been a hard-won journey. When I started eight years ago, I don't think I ever could have predicted some of the complexity involved. I knew as a funder that we had an opportunity to set standards, but I don't think I could have predicted the complexity and 
to some extent, controversy involved in doing that. I think it's, it's useful to reflect on that journey. So, we knew at the beginning that we wanted to commission independent evaluation. And this was something that had been quite different from what had come before in education. So we had to clarify very quickly what we meant by that. And this was controversial. And a few of our early trials fell through as a result. We also knew that we'd be generating lots of really high quality and powerful data. And so with great urgency in 2012, we set up our data archive in order to enable us to track long-term outcomes and enable future reanalysis across trials, uh, some of which we've been hearing about this morning. And that handful of early trials enabled our evaluation partners on our overarching evaluators at Durham University, including Steve Higgins, who's here today, um, to conduct analysis on those early trials and reveal for the first time the true extent of variation that there is in effect sizes as a result of analysis choice. And this inspired the first of our statistical analysis guidance with the aim of improving precision and comparability across trials. We knew we wanted to set really high standards in terms of transparency, pre-specification, um, and reporting. All of those things that might address the, the causes of the so-called replication crisis. Um, so we, in 2014, we, um, we, we, we published templates based on existing standards um, for reporting and protocols. Now, we also knew that we needed something better than statistical significance testing for communicating to schools the reliability or uncertainty around a result. And for this reason, we developed our padlock security rating, which attempts to summarize in a single scale all the sources of bias that might affect and uncertainty that might affect a result. And we realize that this is imperfect and controversial but I think it has a very important idea at its core. I think um, some of our early trials suffered because we were overly focused on the impact. And some of them suffered because they didn't have high enough quality data on implementation and cost and were to some extent a black box. And for this reason, we commissioned uh, a, a, a review, a literature review, uh, from Manchester University, Neil Humphreys, um, which informed guidance around um, implementation and process evaluation um, and the importance of collecting this kind of data. Um, and guidance on cost quickly followed. Um, now, many of you will know um, that we originally were just about attainment from age 6 to 16, but in 2014, we expanded our remit to include the early years and non-attainment outcomes such as self-control um, and resilience. And as a result, we commissioned uh, reviews of the available measures in those areas. You can have the best possible analysis, but if you don't have high quality measures, your results mean nothing. And we'll shortly be um, looking to commission a review of attainment measures as well. Recent developments to the guidance um, and that we've been putting out include updated implementation and process evaluation with the aim of improving theory testing and revision. Um, guidance on longitudinal analysis, and also developing our thinking around alternatives to RCTs. And the analysis guidance is now in its third iteration. Now, all of these developments are not without their flaws, and I know that there is much that we need to get better at. More about this shortly. But I think it's really important to recognize how far we have come. Understandably, as a result of all these developments, the amount that we have spent on evaluation um, as a proportion of evaluation plus grant, so the delivery cost, um, has increased considerably from those, e those early days as we push for ever higher standards and try to get that very difficult balance right between value for money and quality. And that is a very difficult balance that we constantly um, grapple with at the EEF. And of course, we could, ne we could never have done any of this um, without all of our evaluation partners, many of whom are here today, and who have inspired and led many of these developments. I'm really proud to be part of this community. Um, and we really are, I think, in this 
on this journey together. Um, so thirdly, I think it's also um, really important that we celebrate that we've learned lots of new things about what, do, what does work, and also importantly, of course, what does not work. Um, I won't talk a huge amount about this. Alex is going to be talking a lot more about um, this later. But just for example, you know, we've, worked, we've learned a lot about the um, importance of really high intensive targeted approaches. We've learned more about uh, better deployment of teaching assistance and the importance of implementation. But we've also really crucially learned about what does not work. And I think, well, and this speaks to Hugo's presentation, we've learned a lot about, um, you know, often popular programs um, don't always give the returns that they sometimes promise on average. Um, for example, approaches like lesson study or growth mindset. I think it's also really important to say that a lot of what we've learned has not been from the headline finding. 90% of EEF RCTs include at least one secondary outcome or mechanism. And I know that Alex is going to talk later and expand on the need for really high quality data on implementation for head, when heads are making decisions about how to enact change in their schools. And it's also really important to say that EEF trials do not stand alone. They are part of a rich tapestry of evidence that EEF produces including guidance reports, which are based on synthesis, and the teaching and learning toolkit, which Steve is going to talk about later. Synthesis and replication are essential. And I know this is the th a theme that Steve will also be ex expanding upon later. So three things that I think are great successes we should celebrate. Now on to the difficult things. What we're trying to do is not simple. Um, and in fact, I've found that it gets harder the more we learn as we get deeper and deeper into the nitty gritty detail. But I think today's an opportunity to share that burden of responsibility and figure out together what to do next. Now firstly, and I'm, there's lots of difficult things I could talk about, but I've pulled out three. Um, and this is a big one. We have learned that RCTs are not suited to answering some kinds of questions of importance for schools and teachers. There are some things that people are not willing to be randomized. And we have, you know, we have uh, a list of failed RCTs that we have attempted at EEF, including mixed ability grouping versus setting and streaming in schools, too ideological. Financial incentives for teachers, too controversial. And changing a school start time to later in the day to accommodate sleepy teenagers, too impractical. I think we're not yet quite able to answer some of the big questions. And also, the other thing we're not doing yet is sufficiently bridging the, the gap between um, RCTs of programs and what teachers often want to know about, which is um, things around behavior and practice and those decisions that they're making every day in the classroom. For these kind of questions, we need alternative designs, and I'm gonna talk more about this in the next section. Secondly, and this speaks very much um, to Hugo's presentation, we're finding that very few things work better on average than what schools are doing anyway, and particularly at scale. Now, this is a graph of, of um, showing a distribution of effect sizes from 43 EEF RCTs that have all been archived. Um, and that have reading as the primary outcome. So that's the kind of, you know, they're, they're all reading um, primary outcomes. Now, I think it's really important that we're able to say whether something doesn't work as well as whether it does. And I think that the message that there are a few popular programs in the system um, that are working better than what schools are doing anyway is really valuable. But we also need to ask why we're finding this and reflect on how we might adapt our designs and questions to be more precise. So, I've reflected on some of the reasons. So firstly, EF trials always compare to business as usual, and this is highly active. So perhaps we should not see this as a failure of things to work, on av of things to work but as a success story for the teaching profession. 
it's really difficult to change things on average. But that doesn't mean that it's not possible for individual schools and teachers to make a difference, but it does mean that it's essential for us to start to, to try and understand the variation and what works for whom, where, and in what context. But I've also learned that we need hundreds of schools to be able to say, on average, whether something works. So imagine how many we need to be able to say what works for different types of schools and pupils. Thirdly, there's also a real tension for EEF. The education system is fragmented, and there are many programmes available, and very, very few of them are available at scale. To date, we focused on testing the best of what is available in the system based on the existing evidence. And we've learned that very few things work better on average, so perhaps the time has come to start focusing in, focusing in on the things that we have learned make a big difference, or bigger difference. And finally, this is related to the fragmented system, but uh, we have all the usual challenges of scaling. This is the diagram of the pipeline of EEF trials, and there's lots I could say about this, but I think the main um, thing to take away from it is that we are struggling to move programmes successfully from efficacy to effectiveness. And often there's a direct tension for the need, for the, between the need for greater power, um, more schools, and the risk of scaling too quickly, losing quality of implementation, and the scale-up mechanism failing. And we're thinking very hard about how to address this issue, and I'll talk about this shortly. Finally, um, oh, oh no, and the other thing to say is that it's worth noting that as we've learnt these things the hard way, the size of our trials has grown. Um, and this is just reported trials. Ones that we've commissioned um, more recently are, are even bigger still. Um, and finally, um, something that weighs on, um, on all of our minds, um, including mine, is that the EEF's endowment comes with a lifespan. We are halfway through and we have eight years left um, and we're just over halfway through the funding. Yet really high quality RCTs take time to plan and deliver well. The clock is ticking. We need to adapt our designs and questions and methods in order to maximize usefulness with the time left. So what are we doing about this? We have some ideas, but I also want to hear from you. So what about what to test? We've always had a very close relationship with schools, but we are increasingly working with our research school network to identify the questions that teachers and head most, heads most want to know the answers to. Um, and for some of these, we need alternative designs. For this reason, EEF has launched its School Choices funding round, which invites bids from research teams with ideas about how to test those questions that we have either failed to RCT or might be difficult to RCT. Um, the conundrum here, though, is that the very thing that makes these choices um, difficult to RCT, that they are a radical, potentially a radical choice, um, can also make it difficult to create an unbiased match. We've also la launched our Teacher Choices pilots and are working closely with NFER and schools with the aim of exploring the use of within-participant RCT designs to test the choices that teachers make every day, such as what is the most effective way to read to my children or mark homework. We've published, oh, sorry, we've published, be published best practice guidance on implementation and we're increasingly commissioning and collaborating on more dynamic testing and design work at all stages of program development. But there is no doubt more that we could do here to ensure that we are, that we are evaluating well-implemented and theory-driven programs. What about how to test? I think this is all about precision. And um, Sheila Bird, um, she came and gave the keynote at our evaluators conference and there was a very clear message that I took away from, from that and it was all about precision and walking in the shoes of your participants. We need to be more precise about the compliance data we collect, more precise about cost in treatment and control group, more precise about testing theories, including testing different versions of the same program, and more precise about our measures. For this reason, we are starting to try and develop um, further guidance in these areas, um, including on implementation and process evaluation. And we're currently thinking about developing new guidance on cost and um, all the available measures that are um, out there for attainment. But there is no doubt more that we could do here. I've already talked about some of the thinking that we're doing around alternative designs and exploring these through the teacher choices and school choices 
um, pilots, but I've no, no doubt there is more we could do to further explore the potential for RCTs and other designs. Um, another thing is that I think it's true to say that the early years were very much about setting high standards for transparency, pre-specification, um, and, and comparability. But I now get the sense that sometimes EEF is seen as the methods police. Now, <laughs> I'll be, what, a couple more minutes, Sheila. <laughs> Have I got two minutes? Okay. Um, it's really important that we get the balance right and don't stifle innovation. Perhaps there's even a role for us in supporting researchers to progress and develop new methods, for example, by holding innovation competitions. These are things we are thinking about and exploring. Our relationship with evaluators is incredibly important, and there is an opportunity here it would be sad to miss. Finally, I had to end on the archive. We now have 100 RCTs linked to longitudinal data. Um, this archive has huge potential for understanding variation in what works for different types of schools and pupils. That data is available for research, and, please, and we have a, an open funding round, um, open at all times for people with ideas about how to use it. Please do apply. This archive and the Toolkit Database Project, which we'll hear about later, are a very real and exciting legacy that the EEF will leave behind and that I think provide powerful and lasting promise for understanding variation. And I think we can be proud to say that this really is something that is completely new. So, it has been a journey. Um, we're in this together, and that's why I wanted to end with a question back to you. What could or should EEF do different or differently? Thank you. <laughs>to give an example from the days before 2011 when I, amongst many others, were involved with evaluating interventions that had already been rolled out across the country and we had, we had to generate comparison groups, we had to build complex statistical models to try and remove what selection bias there might have been. But I don't actually need to do that. I can give an example of just a few weeks ago and this is an example from uh, a randomized trial that we, um, we had worked on with our developer partner. And we had published the report. We had followed um, rigorously, as we do, the protocol and the statistical analysis plan. And that report was on the EEF website. And what often happens, the developer, then using the same data, will go off and do their own analysis. And in true spirit of collaboration, the developer shared that analysis with us for comment. Here were some of my comments. So this particular comment was made because when we did the fidelity analysis for this particular trial, we'd got the opposite result to the developer. Here's another one. Now, no prizes to this group for knowing what problematic analysis that might yield. Of course, within the, f within the framework of a trial and the constraints we operate in, there's no way we could have done this analysis. Here's another one. So for the statisticians amongst you, the other four um, tests yielded high p-values and the comment was made in the context of some very positive reporting around this single result of not even p is less than 0.05 as it happens. And one more. <laughs> 
So this one, it reminded me of the famous Lancet paper with the star signs, where, where the, the, the authors had deliberately inserted an extra subgroup analysis on the basis of, uh, of astrological star sign to illustrate the weaknesses around such analyses and the fact that they will often throw up false positives. And to me, the difference between the report that we had written and the report that the developer written, had written encapsulated the progress that we've made over the last eight years. The, the, perhaps the best aspect, in my view, of the progress that we've made. Um, really, the replication crisis in a nutshell. So let's go into a little, more, little bit more detail about that. Um, so this is from uh, Johan Edis' 2014 paper on where he, he talks about how we might improve replication uh, or the ability to replicate results in our, in our, in our evaluations. And the first thing he says is um, large-scale collaborative research. Now, one of the things we've only just skirted around so far is the idea that, um, uh, at least with respect to EEF, they commission independent evaluation of their programs. What this does is it forces together two organizations that may not have wanted to work together. The key point to remember with this process is that the pairings are not made before the grants are awarded. The pairings are made after the developer grant is awarded and the evaluation is separately commissioned. And what this means is you have two organizations both with vested interests in getting to their version of the truth. And so you get a very healthy dialogue often between them to get to a better analysis. I can think of an example in recent weeks where the developer spotted a problem with the analysis we were proposing and then literally a few days later we spotted a problem with their solution to that analysis. And this kind of interplay is quite healthy, I think, for replication. Trial registration is another thing that we have done. Um, Sheila asked a, a, a question on that earlier. We've had to piggyback on clinical trials databases for this. Um, typically, the uh, ISRCTN database is what we use. But we do register every trial, and that is a great, that's great progress as compared to what was going on before 2011. Um, and for those of you who don't know, it's important for publication bias to avoid it, to register your trials so that they all get reported. We've also come along leaps and bounds in terms of standardization of definitions, definitions and analyses in particular. We heard from Millie about her, her um, uh, analysis guidance, which the vast majority of evaluators adhere to. And of course, we've had improvements in study design. Um, well, that's why we're here today. So what could we do better? Now, I, I think the accusation that E for the methodology police is certainly not one that I would give. I mean, I think that um, the, this aspect of how we've progressed is crucial, and I would be someone who would argue we could go even further. Over 200 journals now except registered reports. This is the idea that you pre-submit your, um, your methods, your statistical analysis plan, aspects of your report which don't rely on the data before you've even got the data. We're nearly there with EEF. We do publish statistical analysis plans and these are peer reviewed. We're not quite at the registered report stage we should at least talk about whether we need to go that far to improve this aspect of um, trial design and analysis. Another thing I found um, that we're not quite doing yet is pre-submitting our analysis code, the likes of which is done using our repositories in the US by people like Don Green, where the entire analysis code of the trial is um, is, is published in advance of, of seeing the data. This would be another step towards um, improved, even further improved reproducibility. It has been absolutely fantastic to be part of 
the trajectory towards these, 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 um, these methods. And I am not suggesting for one moment that there isn't a place for exploratory research, for exploratory data analysis on secondary data. I'm saying that when you get to the stage of a randomized trial, then you need the straitjacket. You need to be operating in these, um, with these uh, um, constraints because otherwise you get what I showed in the first few slides. <clears throat> what we don't see much of is actual replication of the same experiment. We see movement from efficacy to effectiveness trials, um, but we don't see much where you know, the trial is of sufficient importance to just simply be repeated. EEF has worked a long time over the last eight years on the way we report uncertainty um, in, in our trials reports. And the, the progress, I think, has been um, excellent. What we're not really doing is, um, is fully embracing the, 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 the p-value debates and maybe introducing more, 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 more stringent statistical thresholds. And finally, Ioannidis talks about training of the scientific workforce. So in May next year, there'll be, I think, the 14th um, Randomized Trials in the Social Sciences Conference, which is a, a forum for discussing trials in the social sciences over two days, and there's always a workshop as well. And that's a rare example of when people working in this field can come together to talk about their trial design issues and, um, and, and, and make improvements. But compared to what goes on in the US, I think it's fair to say it's a fraction of the, uh, of the sort of infrastructure, the volume of training. There is a, a challenge with that. I know of academic colleagues who've tried to introduce randomized trials courses as part of their um, you know, university master's degrees and have actually had to pull them because there hasn't been enough sign-up. So we have to think about training, but we also have to think about demand and where that's going to come from. So independence evaluation, which I'm going to talk a bit more about in a minute, I believe to be a real strength. Pre-specification of a single primary outcome Again, a lot of what I'm going to say is about trials being right at the end of the process of evaluation. You really should know what you're measuring when you get to that stage. And if you don't, then maybe not enough has, done, has been done up front. What, one thing we are really good at is sharing our data and also sharing our analysis code. So we've heard about the archive. Um, actually, the analysis code for all of the trials is also shared and nothing much, as far as I know, is being done with that. And, you know, that would be another um, huge opportunity for um, open science people, meta-analysts, meta-researchers to, to, to work with, um, with, with the data that we've got. Why is it worth speaking a bit about this? Well. It's pretty unusual, I think, to have a model where the pairing of the, um, of the developer and the evaluator happens so late in the process. My understanding in, for example, NIHR trials, um, and certainly with Nuffield trials, for example, the, the, you, you, you either do the evaluation yourself or you, you, you pair it with the clinical trials unit in advance. With this model, the evaluator is assigned after the developer has got their grant. I believe it's helpful for reproducibility. It has some unexpected consequences. For example, um, the developer is usually assigned to rec recruiting the schools, which can lead to more of a sales exercise than a recruitment to a study. And this is potentially uh, maybe not ideal for the schools involved. And sometimes the incentives given to the schools to take part are more concerned with their randomized group than they are with the measurement activity going on. 
And this is something which we, we are working with Eve to, to change. Um, but there's, it's easy to confuse the, um, the, the, the disappointment of being randomized to control and the financial reward that that might or might not um, engender to it, it, with, with the, the fact that you have to measure all of the schools in the same way and whether that itself requires incentive. Some of the differences I've looked at between the way ETH Commission trials and the way Nuffield and NIHR Commission, um, I make these comments merely to illustrate the differences. I don't particularly have any strong views as to whether one model is better than another, but they really are quite different, and we should ask ourselves about why that is. So EEF has um, an evaluation team headed by Millie and will assign an individual evaluation manager to each of the trials. Effectively, this model relies on that interplay I've spoken about previously with, with respect to the um, developer and the evaluator coming to a suitable conclusion about the design and the, evaluate, uh, and, and, the, and the analysis of that particular trial. Interestingly, protocols are not peer-reviewed. They're reviewed by the EEF, and they're, they're, they are shared with the developer for comment. Statistical analysis plans are peer-reviewed, as are reports. In fact, the reports go through a lengthy process of peer review, both from um, academic peers, but also uh, you know, uh, impact People, people involved in making the message clearer to teachers and, and, and also the EEF themselves and the developer. So it's a lengthy process of peer review. In Nuffield trials, the governance is very different. An independent advisory group is, is established and they oversee the running of the trial and they're the people that, that sh you share your analysis plan with. And for NIHR trials, the governance is even more tightly defined. So, for example, that independent, we call it trial steering committee, has to have an independent chair, for example, and reports back to the, um, to the uh, it's called the Trials Coordinating Centre, and can stop a trial. And furthermore, you have the Data Monitoring and Ethics Committee, the likes of which we don't see on EEF trials. And some of these differences are reflected in the proposal process, which for EEF, as an evaluator, you'll just get three weeks to write a proposal on reasonably limited information, but the lengthy conversations happen. Once you've won the work and you're in dialogue with a developer over often many months about how the trial is designed. And this is one of the, the, the ways that, you know, it's a sort of, it's a manifestation of that independent evaluation that the proposal is so brief and, and, and constructed in such a small time and can often, you know, change a lot when it comes to the actual protocol. Um, the Nuffield and NIHR models, when, the, you know, when you're working together with an evaluator from the outset, naturally require much more detailed proposals, which are then peer-reviewed over many months and you have to answer questions and so on. So it's quite, it's quite easy. I'm, when I first was part of these different processes, I automatically assumed the, the, the Nuffield model, the NIHR model, was, was that much better for quality. But I hadn't realized, of course, that you know, you've got a different driver of quality in the other model. So we have to ask ourselves, you know, which of these models is, uh, uh, you know, where are, the, where are the better features? Okay, the future. So this... Um, this is the Royal Statistical Society after all, so I thought I'd frame my, my comments about the future within sample size calculations, the likes of which we have to do a lot of, okay? And I'm not going to get particularly technical, but the whole procedure of a sample size calculation actually throws up some of the improvements that we might be able to make as we go forward. <coughs> 
So um, this is an example of um, a trial where we did see a reasonably large effect. Uh, it's the, the largest effect of a trial that um, I've been involved with. Um, and uh, the intervention was very expensive and the security rating, uh, we, lost, we lost a couple of padlocks because we, uh, we lost a, a few students and we tried to follow them up. Um, this is unusual. We've heard that already from Hugo this, um, earlier this afternoon. More likely is this kind of scenario. This was a trial with three groups, a maths group, an English group, a control group, and the, we had two main results, one for literacy, one for maths, and you can see from the width of those confidence intervals that it's really not particularly clear what's going on here. High evidence rating, low cost. This is the kind of trial where you think, was my trial large enough? Was my sample size big enough? Um, we do sometimes have an effect size to go on. So I'm going to <coughs> rifle through the parameters we need when we're establishing the size of a trial. Now, we do sometimes have an effect size to go on when we've had a previous trial, an efficacy trial. It's often very small, as we've heard. But I wanted actually more to focus on the point which has come up already two or three times this afternoon, and that's the preparedness of the intervention. Is it right, as is sometimes the case on a trial, that we are hastily establishing the theory of change during the course of the evaluation. Surely a trial should happen right at the end, when those individual aspects of the theory of change have been unpicked using a variety of research methods. They might be um, secondary data analysis, they might be qualitative, but arguably, if we invested a little bit more time in the development of those interventions before we as trialists saw them, we might not be in the position of seeing such low effects. Now, I do caution that with, with, a, with a word of warning, and that's that there are examples from medicine where people didn't know what was going on and the trial yielded incredibly important results. Now, I'm not a medic, but I can think of um, the crash trial, the original trial where they, um, uh, they gave oxygen to uh, premature babies, this kind of thing, where trials are really important to elicit results that are unexpected. But I think you need both. I think you need to do some, you need to do some of that, but you also need to be ready with your intervention both in terms of its theory of change and in terms of its, um, it, it, its suitability for rollout during a trial. We should be right at the end, and I sometimes feel we're not at the end of the research trajectory. Other things that are challenging when we d design a trial are the, param the other, other, other parameters we need for sample size calculations are things like the correlation between the pre-test and the post-test and the intra-class, as we call it in education, correlation. We tend to call it, sorry, we tend to call it the intra-cluster correlation because the intra-class correlation is, is, is misleading. Um, these parameters are calculated every time another research group runs a trial. And what we really need is a repository of these parameters, written up, published, so that we can share all of the data together and have something to refer to when we are developing our trials and doing our sample size calculations. There was a moment, actually, about three or four years ago, when we had a consistent um, uh, pattern of national testing when we, we did, the Durham team did produce some of these parameters and we were able to use them. Because the national tests changed, we're now no longer in that position and I maintain that we could also be in that position for non-statutory tests if we were to publish and share that data. 
It's an example of the kind of methodological need that we've got that we talked about this morning in the, in the more methodological session. You could do really interesting things, like introduce a cost element for the delivery of a baseline, and, uh, and you could actually work out whether it was more efficient to run or not run a baseline on the basis of the other parameters. We don't really do this stuff. Correlation, pretest to post-test, is a function of reliability. We heard from Millie that there are two excellent databases of measures, the early years measures database and the spectrum database. We desperately need the other one that she mentioned for all of the other age groups so that we can compare our measures in a more systematic way when we're choosing them. We also need something for when we can't actually use an off-the-peg measure and we have to design it ourselves. This is a study in its own right, and arguably there isn't the funding, the time to actually develop our own measures when we need to. Um, an, an example of when that, that, that's a problem, this is just a brief example of when, when we did go wrong and we followed the instructions on the tin, as it were. We used a measure that was um, uh, you know, a, devised for that particular age group, but it was almost useless because that particular, for this particular trial, the, age, the, the, the eligible children in question were um, selected on the basis of them um, not passing the year one phonics check and were there, therefore found the test far, far too hard. And this is an example of where piloting a measure would have really helped. Piloting is a difficult one in education trials. You don't always have to do it because often you are administering a test which has been administered many times before and you don't need to rehearse that. Sometimes you do and it's about making a judgment of when you do and having a, a, a constructive dialogue about uh, you know, when, it, when, when to pilot and when not to pilot. In summary, um, I, I believe that we should continue to prioritize the open science uh, practices that we've seen develop over the last eight years. I think we should relook at the process, the, the, the sort of the incubation chamber for the interventions and what's going on there before we see them at trial stage. Um, we do need more time, potentially sometimes at least, to pilot. And we need to invest in our infrastructure and our methods research as well as training. Similar methods, messages to what we've heard before, but um, coming from a slightly different perspective. Thank you very much. Okay, um, my name's uh, Steve Higgins. I work at Durham University. Uh, I've worked closely with the Education Endowment Foundation since it originally started. Uh, I'm probably um, best known for the work I did on developing the Teaching and Learning Toolkit, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, you'll see uh, up on the screen, um, there's a medieval map of the world, a mapa mundi, uh, and the reason why that's there will become apparent as I uh, undertake the talk. I I'm going to nail my colours to the mast at the beginning because we don't have a lot of time. Um, uh, and I think it's important to say that I see RCTs as sometimes necessary but never sufficient to establish that something works or as I'd prefer to say, has worked. Uh, and that one trial, however rigorous and robust, will never be definitive, particularly in education. The other thing, speaking as a meta-analyst, is that meta-analysis is not replication. And it's really important to bear that in mind, because it's kind of taken as a proxy for that. And I think that's highly um, problematic, even though it is the best that we have at the moment. And then, while nailing my colours to the mast, a threshold of 0 0.05 for statistical significance in a developed field is too low, too narrow, and too confusing a bar. Uh, 
and I'll try and explain what I mean by that as I go through the talk. Okay, I'm going to, a bit like Carol, um, take a, a look back over meta-analysis, what we do it for and why I think it's important. Uh, it's about aggregating research findings to get a more definitive answer. And it has a long history. We usually look back to the 1970s, but you can see the, the history of the development of some of the statistical techniques much e earlier last century. I'm also going to talk a little bit about what I see as a cautionary tale, a meta-analysis, or what I'd call a meta-analysis from the 1940s, uh, and then talk a little bit, uh, though not much today, about some of the origins of meta-analysis in terms of its technical development, kind of what motivated it, and, and some of the important features of the field. Uh, a, a bit like Carol, I kind of dug back through the history books to think about what might be recognizable as a meta-analysis. Uh, and, and Pearson, uh, as in the famous Pearson, uh, was interested in the difference between different vaccinations. Um, and he was particularly interested in how, how poor vaccination seemed to be for what was called at the time enteric fever, um, typhoid. Uh, because he, he found that some vaccinations were relatively predictable in their effects, uh, and others particularly the vaccination for enteric fever, wasn't. So he did what I would describe as a proto-meta-analysis, which you can see on the right-hand side, where he's looking at the results using correlations of the effects of vaccination on these different garrisons uh, in a war setting in, in South Africa. Um, this idea that we want to understand, or at least get a better handle on the extent of the difference, how much difference does something make, is a key feature for me of meta-analysis, and you can see in his work. But you can also in his, see in his work a driver to explain the variation in effects, something we often forget in meta-analysis, but we've talked a fair amount about today. And he was also interested in a practical approach to improving the effectiveness of inoculation. And again, that for me is analogous to what we're trying to do in education. The cautionary tale comes from 1940, where Pratt and Ryan and uh, uh, other colleagues uh, conducted a systematic review. I think it's pretty recognizable as a systematic review, though I'm, I should set Carol on that task to see if she thinks it is. Uh, and then a meta-analysis of 145 ESP, extrasensory uh, perception studies, conducted between 1882 and 1939. They did a pretty painstaking job they reviewed the experimental errors, clustered results from several experiments, and looked at subgroup analysis. Their conclusion was that ESP works. We'd perhaps differ in our interpretation of what that means today. And there's certainly something about drawing conclusions from aggregation which depends on the internal validity of the underlying studies. The design, the possibility for experimenter or research the re research subject uh, uh, influence in those studies, uh, I think, deserves further look. Uh, and there's also clearly a risk of publication bias, uh, and some of the uh, contemporaries at the time commented that some researchers had run their studies many times before they got their published result. What it does do is highlight the problems from lack of replication. And I don't think that we've addressed that problem today. So some of these areas we've made progress in, others we haven't. And it's interesting to speculate on why. My particular interest is in what I call metasynthesis. So not just meta-analysis, but taking that horrifying step for a statistician of trying to get a big picture of what the effects of different meta-analyses meta might mean in relation to each other a kind of a bird's eye view, if you like, of the landscape. Hence my metaphor of the Mappa Mundi, if you like. The overview, what's the picture that we get when we hover over and suspend our disbelief about the comparability of effect sizes. We heard mention earlier today of Hattie's work, and although he's widely criticized today in statistical circles for his work on visible learning, he was the first to develop the use of standardized mean difference 
as opposed to correlational effect sizes, work that he, he built on from Benjamin Bloom. Also forgotten in the history of educational meta-analysis is a very painstaking meta-analysis by Sipen Curlett in the mid-1990s, who painfully set out the criteria for the rigor of the methodology that would be necessary to identify comparable effects across studies. We also saw at about the same time Robert Marzano trying to address what you might call big theoretical questions in education using studies, um, a series of meta-analyses and to draw inferences across them in terms of what works in terms of learning. What you actually find in most of these early meta-analyses in education is they're not at all atheoretical. They're not trying to just to work out what works. They're driven by an underlying desire to understand the different components of the educational system in a theoretical model. I've always bristled a bit at the criticism that meta-analysis uh, is atheoretical. Of course, it can be, but it depends on what drives your meta-analysis. What's interesting is the diverse terminology. We've got meta-meta-analysis, mega-analysis, supersynthesis, um, supersyntheses, um, uh, meta-synthesis. But it was this thinking that led to the development of the teaching and learning toolkit. And I've been extremely lucky in my research to have my work adopted by the Education Endowment Foundation, who found that this communicates well to teachers in terms of thinking about the relative benefit of different educational interventions. Now, I don't have to tell this audience that that's highly problematic in all kinds of ways, but it does address an underlying issue that teachers don't just want to know whether a particular uh, researcher's intervention has worked in a single co context and passes a p-value threshold. They want to get an idea of this is better than that, of how much it'll cost. They want a much more systematic mapping of the evidence to help them make decisions in schools. The toolkit's actually been remarkably successful. Again, for a whole series of complicated reasons, I don't think it's to do with the brilliance of the underlying data, but it is now consulted by about 70% of schools in England. Now, from my point of view, that puts an enormous pressure on me as the designer to think about what the warrant is that underpins it. What we were doing was actually fairly simple. I describe it usually as trying to get a witch guide for education research. What are the best buys that you can get? What are the indications that we can give practitioners with all the limitations that we understand about the evidence in terms of what's likely to be productive? So it summarizes the evidence from meta-analysis about the impact of different strategies on attainment. Uh, I kind of think about this as a series of uh, umbrella reviews and of course, it's limited to attainment. It's also limited to sample averages, which again, we've talked about today as problematic. Uh, we do apply criteria to evaluations and we're interested particularly in causal designs, in, in designs for causal inference. And I'll come back to that towards the end. We estimate the size of the effect using standardized mean difference. We've converted this to months gain, which again, I accept is highly problematic. But what we also tried to do, and what I think possibly many people have forgotten, is we tried to estimate the costs of adopting. If there was one area that I could develop further in the toolkit, it should be the rigor of that methodology. Schools make these decisions all the time. What's the cost benefit of using teaching assistance as opposed to buying in new technology or reducing class sizes? They make those decisions implicitly, and we need to develop that methodology further. EEF has gone a long way to distinguish between the evaluation costs and the implementation costs of different programs. That work needs further, uh, further development. At the moment, there are 35 strands in the main toolkit. Those of you familiar with it will be used to the layout. I've ranked them there, which isn't actually the default layout. It's usually alphabetical. The surprising thing is how much purchase this has got internationally. So there is an early years version but we're also now working with partners, Evidence for Learning in Australia, we're working with partners in Latin America, there's a Spanish and Portuguese version for Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, 
Uh, Scotland has developed a version. Interestingly, they've simply reversed the words teaching and learning to learning and teaching. I'll let you ponder on the uh, detailed inferences you might want to draw from that. Uh, there's a version now uh, for Spain that's been funded by Educaica, the um, uh, Spanish bank uh, charitable arm, and we're working with uh, the Queen Rania Foundation in Jordan to develop a, uh, a, an Arabic version. So what have we learned? The comparative messages from metasynthesis are welcomed by policymakers and practitioners. Not everything works as well as people think. That's actually a really important message and one that has perhaps been driven home today. The phrase I'm probably most famous for when talking to practitioners is what I call the banana rama effect. It ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it. But I'd argue that that means that the within strand differences are larger than those between strands. So there is a statistical principle underlying what seems like a humorous message. I think, and this is controversial, that lack of randomization may not introduce as much bias as we suspect. Those of you who heard Ben's talk this morning will have seen a very similar argument. In the toolkit, in about a third of meta-analyses, uh, randomization is associated with higher effect sizes. Uh, in about a third of the meta-analyses, lower effect sizes, and in about a third, there isn't really any difference. Carol's glowering at me from down below, a topic we've often discussed. Having said that, I do think that randomization is essential. I think RCTs provide what I'd describe as the surveying pegs in the educational landscape. We'll never be able to afford to do randomized trials in all of the areas that we'd want to do. So we need to hammer them in the ground strategically and draw inferences across the evidence in between. Of course, in a perfect world, it'd be nice to bottom out on all of those differences more rigorously, but I'm pretty realistic now about what levels of funding we're likely to have, so I think we need to be judicious in where we hammer in those pegs and think quite carefully, using a surveying metaphor, of what we might be able to infer as each peg is hammered in. We certainly know that some of the variation in effect sizes can be explained by aspects of design and measurement. Smaller standard deviations for younger populations, more complex outcomes, harder to achieve high effect sizes, uh, inverse relationship between sample size and effect size. We, we know quite a lot about that distribution. Were we able to coordinate all of that evidence in a single database, we might be able to work out a model of effect size variation. It's a highly problematic measure. If someone come up with something better, I'll start using it tomorrow. This is the way I see research and evidence challenges. I think you can think of the top and bottom half of the diagram as being researcher and provider responsibilities compared with policy and practice responsibilities. So I think accuracy, accessibility, and actionability, slightly horrible word, uh, are the responsibility of the researcher. Working out whether that research is appropriate, applicable, and acceptable is much more the domain of, the, of practice or policy. I worry about the accuracy of the data underlying the toolkit. I try and make it as rigorous as we possibly can. It certainly succeeded in its purchase in how accessible it is and that's the most positive feedback we get from teachers. But for me, that's an incredibly difficult balance to work. The toolkit isn't particularly actionable, and you'll hear a bit more in a few minutes about what EEF is trying to do to develop how we turn that research evidence about what's worked in particular circumstances to something that might apply in other setting. I think it has to be appropriate, and this is where we don't fully understand what the limitations are of sample averages to population averages. What are the variables we might want to take into account about applying our understanding from a specific co context to another one? I'd also argue that if you're trying to bring about improvement, you should be looking for approaches that are a solution to a problem. 
So don't just try things from a search randomly, but look at what areas of practice might need improvement and then look for solutions from research. You're much more likely to see gain. I think it's also then got to be very specifically applicable in terms of phase, subject, content, particularly content. We often airbrush in pedagogical research what the detailed match of the intervention is to people need. We also heard a little bit from Millie about that research also has to be acceptable. It has to fit individual teachers and the school system's understanding of what change is possible. That last one was added only recently in the last few years as we started to grapple with this particular problem. The toolkit has all kinds of problems. It's separate meta-analyses, different inclusion criteria, has inconsistent qu quality, and is limited to fixed effects averages. Has very poor granularity as a result of that. If I put that into technical issues, we've got effect size comparability. Most moderator analyses, like subgroup analyses, are underpowered. And there's systematic var variation associated with a number of features, as I mentioned before. EEF's current solution, which I've been lucky enough to persuade them I can undertake, is to create a database of impact studies in education. So we can move from the meta-meta analysis to a single large meta-analysis to develop its overall accuracy and also more specifically to, improve, uh, to uh, improve the reviews that underpin the guidance reports. It should make those much easier to complete. It'll also inform our work with international partners as we start to understand which findings are nationally specific and which might apply across a wider context. So what we're now working on, and I'm running out of time, um, is uh, the database of what I call unzipping. Of course, that won't be enough because that'll only be a partial representation of the education evidence data, data that we've got. So we'll need eventually to backfill that and then eventually create a sustainable source for living reviews. So the toolkit will become a live resource that's configurable by age and phase. We've unzipped so far 28 of the toolkit strands. We've identified just over 7,000 studies, screened, uh, retrieved full texts, and coded about 1,200 uh, 1, of them in a single database with common inclusion criteria. We've started mapping these studies to the Microsoft Academic Database with the Epicenter in London, because we think that'll help us backfill the meta-analyses which give you these partial snapshots of education studies. We've started to explore some, uh, some uh, to do some exploratory meta-analyses just to make sure we can do that. And the vision is that we could then look at, say, something like peer tutoring, look at the effect on tutors, tutees, or reciprocal peer tutoring. We'd start to look at the impact on literacy, mathematics, and science. We can report a pooled effect in its confidence intervals although they're mis often misunderstood in what they mean in terms of meta-analysis, but most importantly, explore heterogeneity and the causes of that in that database. So is it what works or what, what's worked? Those of you who heard me speak before know that I'm passionate in arguing that it's what's worked. Uh, I bristle at the title of, of the What Works Center for Education and Schooling, if we'd solved the problem of external validity, EEF would be an awful lot further down the road. There are all kinds of issues that we still need to bottom out on. How do you define approaches and interventions? What's the unit of description and the causal model? What's the nature of the population we're inferring to? How does that change over time? We absolutely need to know not just what's worked, but also what hasn't worked on average, a key part of the argument for a database. Do we use the mean or the range? Do we focus on average or better estimates of probability, uh, as Zeman Zhao was explaining this morning in thinking about individual estimates? Sample averages, subgroups, or individuals is where we need to go. And are we looking for uh, generalizability or predictability? One final slide, because I, um, I can see me being about to be edged off my stool. Um, and that's... This final point about a higher bar, I think we need to think quite carefully about what we mean um, 
when we think about statistical significance. It's been a lot in the press. In education, do we want the zero line? Is that our starting point? Or do we want to set a threshold that's more ambitious in terms of what might be educationally meaningful? Also, why do we obsess about sampling uncertainty without thinking about measurement uncertainty or other aspects of design attrition uncertainty? We could calculate those and represent them in the same way with confidence intervals. We could have a fading out confidence interval from 0 0.1, 0 0.5 to 10% level. So there are other ways that we could represent that. What we do know, however, is that education is a complex problem. And for every complex problem, there's a simple solution that is simple, neat, but wrong. Thank you. Okay, afternoon everybody. Um, I stand here um, as an employee of the EF, and I've worked for the EF for the last year. But in this session, I'm going to actually draw upon my experience in the classroom as a teacher and as a school leader and the interpretations and inferences that I drew from RCTs. And I'm actually going to look at individual projects with the you know, supposition that we take it for granted that's problematic to make judgments from individual projects. But actually, I want to just present the lived experience of school leaders making decisions. And I think RCTs are part of a rich evidence picture and they are not the whole picture and I want to move on to the other parts which both at the EF we concentrate upon but also as a school leader you have to think about so I want to go a bit broader than RCTs too but I thought um, it was useful to just draw upon um, a set of shortcuts for our, how I used RCTs and how I think a lot of school leaders interpret RCTs and I say school leaders because I think if we're talking about an audience of teachers and school leaders I think a lot of the RCT evidence that is out there generated by the EF and, and others is actually more orientated for school leaders so I'll, I'll focus on that emphasis but then I'll move towards some of the other evidence in the picture that's more usable and useful for teachers. Um, I think the first useful aspect of RCTs is that they present us with a warning and they can pre present us with a check on our enthusiasm. I think one of the realities of being a school leader is you are short on money, you are short on time, you are short on training, and within that environment, you have to make quick, flawed, bad decisions. And it's just trying, really, to make as few bad decisions as possible and trying to navigate those challenges. And I think with some of the trials, and I'll share an example um, that served as, as a warning, it actually is just a useful stop on enthusiasm. And one of the other realities of being a school leader is you get 100 emails a day, and a third of those emails are trying to sell you something. And of those, lots of them pose that they have the best evidence for the product they're, they're selling you. So what we see from a lot of RCTs is whether they are directly evidence of a certain product, that's often not the case, but they just pose a warning around this general area, these kind of general considerations. Um, the next shortcut they offer is they just pose some best bets. They don't give you a what will work in your school context. They just give you something to infer from and to inform your professional judgment. And sometimes, as a school leader, you are in that position of choosing a literacy intervention for a really important group in your school. I had that experience multiple times as a school leader, both as a middle leader leading a large English department and as a senior leader in a large secondary school. So sometimes you are making that bet that this is more likely to work in our context with all the caveats that that brings. Another factor um, which was a, a lucky experience, I don't think this is an experience for all school leaders, is that you can learn a lot about teaching and learning. You can learn about some of the factors around your decision making if you dig into the evaluation of some of these RCTs. And actually, I'll, I'll talk actually quite a lot around the process evaluation 
And it's not just the impact outcome that's informative for a school leader, it's what you learn from the process about why things didn't quite work, around what's harder to enact than other things. Um, and, and I'll come back to that one. And then lastly, um, an RCT, quite frankly, can be a lever for change in a school. And that can be in a variety of ways. So it can be a lever for change in terms of its giving some sense that something works better than an alternative. And it gives a, you know, a ballast to an argument, which can be used and abused, um, that, that's for sure. But also it can be a lever in terms of if you are part of an RCT, and I want to give ex exemplification of that as, as my school, that we used being part of that RCT to gain training, to learn, and to inform our future decisions. So there's lots of um, ways that an RCT can benefit school leaders that probably haven't been discussed because they're quite pragmatic and they're, they can be idiosyncratic. They don't happen everywhere. I think it would be fair and truthful to say that lots of schools have not got the learning they can from RCTs and they've not necessarily gleaned the knowledge and they've not necessarily been able to use it as a lever. I don't pre present this easy picture that all RCTs are, are giving this rich knowledge picture. They're not, but they can. And I want to pose example, exemplification of that. Um, so if I just go back to the warning example, um, and um, earlier on, we, uh, Hugo was talking about the cost, um, and it really strikes me around how much money you know, perhaps the EF has and is, is an endowment, I recognize that. School budgets, so my school in York had a budget of over six million pounds. Um, the vast majority, over 80% is staffing, but then you've got you know, budgets for lots of different things, some of which are not enough for teaching and learning. Um, so we're talking about large budgets, and actually one thing we're not talking about is the counterfactual around money that's getting spent in the system all the time with, without any checks on whether that's a good thing or not. So one of the um, things that struck me a couple of weeks ago, um, I don't know whether people spotted it in the news, was about iPads um, in Glasgow. So the um, authority have decided to invest in an iPad for every child in Glasgow, and that cost would be 300 million. And actually, I've been in sales pitches by people presenting iPads. I've done training around being a, an Apple distinguished educator. I've led a small, um, just very small scale trial about using iPads for learning and tried to glean what I, ca what I can. And all I know is that that 300 million pounds is going to have to contort and do some amazing things if there's going to be value gleaned from that money. And sometimes actually what the RCTs help us with is this you know, warning sign and this challenge to our assumptions. And I don't think anyone in Glasgow has any sort of you know, negative or kind of you know, sinister you know, s sense of how that would be used. They expect that good things will happen, and perhaps they will, but evidence from America, evidence from other places, evidence from RCTs would indicate, and evidence in our guidance report on digital technology would indicate it'd be quite hard to do so, and there's lots of support factors that you need. And, and that's where RCTs can help and offer us, some th sometimes that challenges our intuitions and challenges us as we make fast, flawed decisions in difficult circumstances. Um, one example, I, at the moment, uh, you may be aware that schools are very interested in developing their curriculum. That is the case because Ofsted have changed their inspection framework and there is more of an emphasis on curriculum. Now, Schools are always focusing on curriculum. It's painting the fourth bridge type stuff. You never finish it. But there's a renewed emphasis on curriculum that for the next year or two is going to generate a lot of effort from teachers and school leaders, a lot of training, and a lot of work. And actually, at this point, school leaders are making decisions around how they might develop the curriculum, how they might enrich the curriculum, and they're making their bets. And um, this project on project-based learning is one singular project, so with all, the, with all the caveats that comes with. But for me, when this 
um, was published. What it revealed uh, from the 24 schools is the challenges to change school curriculum. And actually that most schools in England don't have an infrastructure for project-based learning. So to change that school structure and change the curriculum requires a lot of support. And in this project, we had the best possible conditions. We had expert supports for those schools. But when you dig into the process evaluation and you look at the attrition and the difficulties schools faced, actually, we've learned a lot, not just about the impact and the, and the outcomes, um, which are negative. Actually, we learned that this was just a really difficult thing to change in school. So for me, it doesn't say project-based learning cannot work or does not work, far from it. It just gives me caution and it reveals the challenges of making any changes, but then when we get something that's as complex as a curriculum change and making structural changes, this is a real call and a warning for schools about what they do next. It doesn't offer you the answers. It just offers you a warning and about your own implementation and your own practices. Um, I, I, in terms of time, I, I won't spend too much time on the conclusions, but, but for me, as a school leader, and, and perhaps it isn't you know, representative of all school leaders, but it's getting past the headlines and start to look at the conclusions and start to dig in to the evaluation. I think that's where, if you've been tracking the progress of the evaluations conducted for the EF, there's much more of that process and richness that you can dig into so you can learn the why as well as the what. And for school leaders, often it's the why because implementation is where things fall down. This, um, another warning factor, um, is around a, a singular project on lesson study. Again, this is another very popular vehicle for teacher development. And this project doesn't tell us that lesson study doesn't work, although some people made that inference and that would be wrong. But what it does tell us is that in and of itself, we have to think very hard about implementation, about the process of training teachers, and that lesson study might have a high bar and that you need to consider what support factors you would need for lesson study to work in your context. Now, there's been lots of discussion around lesson study and, well, you know, critique of the trial, that was it testing lesson study or was it actually testing taught for literacy, which was part, which is what the lesson study offered the vehicle for. And, and those questions, they're valid, and we should be asking those questions and not take one singular trial as condemning or, you know, kind of gleaning this is a flourishing, brilliant product or process. But it certainly raises questions. And I was leading whole school training in my school. This trial didn't exist when I was making decisions, but we made whole school changes around coaching more than once on little more than a hunch and a hope. And this didn't offer me an answer, and this didn't pose an easy solution. But when you look at this, when you look at the embedded formative assessment RCT, you can start to make best bets and think, okay, well, that structure has challenges. This structure has challenges. But given the lay of the land, given our support factors, we might be best working with this and thinking really hard as we go about doing so. Um, the either or, I think this is a reality. Uh, it's a reality for school leaders. I think less so for teachers in terms of most teachers don't get a chance to make decisions about whole school um, focus. But if I just pick a couple of projects, both around parental engagement, um, you've got the testing parents and you've got uh, texting parents, not testing parents, that's a completely different thing. Um, I'd fail that one. Um, and Parent Academy. And we have um, Parent Academy, you know, zero month impact. We have uh, small effects for texting parents. And actually, for me, as a school leader, it's less the value I'm taking from the effect size. It's more what judgments I'm making around the process and around the challenge and the cost and the effort. So with texting parents, 
you know, you can dig into the, and you can look at some other inferences around text messaging and communicating with parents, and you can start digging into the evidence. And that's useful. That can steer some of your practices. When you look at Parent Academy, actually lots and lots of schools across the country are doing a variant of Parent Academy. I've led it before. We bring parents in. We try and work with them. Most of them don't turn up, um, but we do it, and we, and we just try and make it better next time. Now, these, both of these projects don't say to me, you should do this, but I can make uh, an either-or judgment. And actually, my judgment around some decisions we made around parental engagement is to do less, to actually stop doing some things. So our, our equivalent parent academy, where we invested a lot of time um, bringing parents in, but having the real difficulties with attendance and with follow-up, et cetera, we actually stopped doing that, and we thought about different ways of communicating with parents, and we thought about being more bespoke to individual parents and families. These two projects didn't give us that answer, but they just gave us nudges and inferences around our judgment. In terms of developing pro professional knowledge, I think one of the, um, it, it's quite unique, is that I both had the privilege of being a school leader and, and learning from evidence, but also being part of a randomized control myself. So um, I uh, led uh, this project, um, the RISE project, which was about research leads. Um, so research leads hyphenated to keep the whole RISE moniker. Uh, research leads um, improving students' education. And the notion was around knowledge mobilization. The theory was that if we can support teachers to be better informed, they can make better decisions. Um, and actually, we learned lots. I learned a huge amount personally. It's the biggest learning experience of my career because I spent 13 years as a teacher and school leader, spectacularly undertrained. Um, and it was the first sustained training that I got in the development of the program with the likes of Professor um, Rob Coe and Stuart Keim. Um, but actually, I draw from this because I got the chance to work with 20 schools, um, the treatment schools, and we, you know, we had a two-year process, which was really rich with understanding. When you start to dig into um, the surface outcomes, again, it doesn't tell you a great deal. But trying to be independent of this, and, and I joined the EF by the point that this was published, so all kinds of biases um, from me personally. But one of the things that, stu that stood out for me, and this is drawn from the evaluation, is some of the inferences made from the process evaluation. And they struck home with me in terms of being useful insights, because actually, hundreds of schools across the country had designated people research leads, just like they designated people three years before as assessment leads and digital leads, etc. So people were doing this, and this was a good chance to actually think, well, what are the active ingredients for research leads for mobilizing evidence in schools? There is no easy answer. There is no, you can just read the evaluation and then you know, you've got it nailed. But actually, this is informing our judgment because lots and lots of schools are spending lots of their time, effort, and money doing things they're not quite sure about without the conditions to properly evaluate. So this gives us a, a helpful stand back and a mirror on some of those practices in the school system. What the RISE project was you know, imitating was lots of practices that are happening in multi-academy trusts right now. And yet we don't quite know how they're working and we don't yet know whether those new leadership positions hold value. So we're still asking questions. Um, and then lastly, um, using and seeing um, RCTs as a lever for change. So one of the um, um, trials that our school engaged in um, was the grouping trial. Um, and we engaged in it um, for different reasons. One, probably, you know, we were interested and, and pro-EF, we were, um, the likes of the RISE project, etc. And we were highly research engaged. But we had questions. We had an English department who had um, a grouping model which was mixed attainment. We had a maths department who had a grouping model which was more traditionally in sets. Um, and actually, that department were interested in changing. But there was a fear and concern 
that parents and the department were unsure how they would go about moving from mixed attainment to setting in mathematics because you can count on your hand just how many secondary schools in the country have that model. So taking part in this project was about learning and this was about the professional development that the math teachers got from being part of that project and also it allowed us to effectively pilot a change which had the ballast and support and weight of being in a, a research project. So it's something we can communicate to staff, communicate to parents. So actually, it was a really valuable school improvement tool that, that went beyond just grouping models in mathematics. And there, was, and there was really interesting learning. And sometimes I think that's forgot. When we can talk about the big data sets, which have been the focus of a lot of the talk today, huge meta-analyses, you know, huge financial figures, and we miss what's happening in schools, and we miss what's happening in terms of leaders' decision-making. And even when we present, you know, 70% of school leaders, you know, referring to the toolkit, et cetera, getting underneath that, some of, those, some of that 70% will be really poor use. And actually, getting underneath and understanding that is just as important as having really robust statistical analysis. And I stated earlier about it being part of a rich evidence picture. Um, you know, we, I think there's no one in the room who thinks that RCTs are the answer to all of our questions. You know, uh, Millie stated that earlier, we don't think that the EF either, and we're constantly trying to iterate and get better. Um, my role at the EF um, isn't about evaluation, uh, people far more expert than me. My role at the EF is around mobilizing insights from research evidence, trying to support high quality implementation, try to work with school leaders so that the RCTs get mediated in a way that is critical and useful. And they, be, they were mentioned earlier by Millie, but what that's led is we have our RCTs which inform our guidance for teachers, but in and of themselves, they wouldn't be able to give practice guidance. We have our literature reviews, and together, the literature review, the systematic review, and the RCTs that inform our guidance start to give a fuller picture. So one example, our secondary literacy guidance that we published just in the summer, and we've just released some tools for that secondary literacy guidance, the likes of the reciprocal reading RCT, that we've conducted and other RCTs inform directly the case studies and the exemplification for that guidance. So what we have to do is continue to mediate and adapt and communicate the findings from RCTs and learn from them and have really great process evaluation and high quality impact evaluation. But we still need a richer, wider picture too. Um, and it was cited earlier around teacher choices but that's a recognition that we're also looking to answer those questions for teachers. And we're trying to generate and, and explore and evaluate ourselves different methodologies to still have that rigor, but get to the level of the questions that teachers want to answer about their daily practice. I think some of the, proje some of the projects we looked at earlier are about really important decisions that are made once or twice a year whereas we also want to inform those decisions that happen every day in the classroom, in the SLT meeting, on a Tuesday at half five when everyone's tired. Um, and it is about adapting tools and support for that. You know, RCTs help inform, help retain a rigor, give us lots of information. They don't answer all of our questions, but we don't presuppose that they do. They are part of a richer, broader picture. And for me, I think, I think we've still got a long way to go in terms of training and support for new teachers, for school leaders around accessing reliable, high quality research evidence, around asking good questions themselves, around being critical about the 30 adverts they get sent on email a day, and, and, and grappling with the complexity that has been the focus for today. But I think without RCTs, we would just still be a few steps behind. They're imperfect, and it's about moving forward and making those developments and improvements. And they informed my judgment as a school leader. They, did they make me a better school leader? Well, you know, maybe there's some sort of evaluation out there um, about my practice. 
but professionally it was nourishing and it gave me some ballast to make better decisions um, as I attempted. So I'm, I'm conscious um, I've run over a little, um, but thank you very much. Well, we have a, three of us have a, a pretty impossible task, which is to sort of try and bring to some sort of conclusion this, what's been a sort of Glastonbury of experts in um, educational RCTs. And like all good conferences, it's confirmed some of my prejudices. Um, it's overturned a couple of other ones. And I think we've got a lot of food to take away for thought. Um, very, very hard not to say anything that's not been said before. So I'm going to just run through some of my sort of sweeping thoughts from my notes from, uh, from, from the day, and we can sort of tidy up some of those thoughts later. And I should say that th this comes from the perspective of a, a major funder of educational research for whom RCTs are just one of many tools. In fact, quite a, uh, it's quite a small proportion of what we do. Um, and my thoughts are under the headings of rationale for RCTs, expectations, uh, implementation, outcome measures, and the promotion and positioning of RCTs in general. Um, on the rationale, I think we need collectively, whether intervention developers and users or researchers or funders and commissioners, to raise the bar uh, in terms of what the justification is for a full RCT approach. Be tougher on the evidence of promise. I think too many uh, uh, interventions are un 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 experienced full RCT approach uh, prematurely or before the feasibility is established. I think things have improved on that front, but it remains the case. So, picking up an earlier point, yes, I would support fewer, larger trials, but um, there needs to be a strong role for funders like us to strengthen the pipeline, which is what we're trying to do. Um, and um, on expectations, I think what, what I've heard from today is that our expectations of effect size might need to come down a little bit, um, particularly in the context of, of, of more rigorous trials. Small effects can often uh, uh, constitute significant educational progress particularly when you start taking value for money um, into account. Um, now, the flip side of that is that really powerful interventions are often very time-consuming and uh, difficult for, quite a big ask for schools, and so require a much more careful sort of two-way street for the developers of interventions with um, those that might be using them in order to stand a chance of being authoritative. Um, on outcome measures, I think there's challenges in the selection of outcomes. Many of the best interventions operate through improving quite specific outcomes with a longer-term impact on more common standardised measures of achievement. And I also think, so we don't <coughs> want to be too restrict restrictive, but also we need to follow up longer-term outcomes much more. I think, you know, somebody mentioned the Perry Preschool project. Uh, uh, you know, despite its small sample sizes, problems of randomization. Um, the fact that it was um, in a very, very specific um, context shows how, because they followed up outcomes for many years, over many decades, in fact, uh, that's been an incredibly powerful uh, influence on, uh, on, on, on policy, not just in the United States, but also uh, internationally. So something to, something to learn from that about ca continuing to measure outcomes. Just going to end, um, uh, I'm feeling a, a bit of a glare here already, um, <laughs> from scary Sheila. Um, uh, just with um, three very quick fire points on um, the sort of promotion and positioning of um, RCTs. Um, on longer term, I think we do need to continually promote the advantages of RCTs. The experience that was described earlier, you know, in a sort of more historical um, session, uh, about the sort of waxing and waning of that approach, there's people talking about dark ages and paradigm wars, all very kind of Game of Thrones. Um, uh, uh, I think there's dangers of the sort of post-EF world. I mean, EF's money runs out, and who knows what a, a subsequent government might do for that. It's been a you know, massively welcome intervention into the research uh, ecology. Um, and look how well we do. I noticed somebody had a graph up. Look how well we do compared to Europe, um, other European countries. I mean, a big proportion of uh, European RCTs are done in this, in this country. But the danger is that um, if people see that very few of those interventions have actually had a longer-term impact and have been rolled out, um, there might be a backlash um, further down the line. Secondly, very disappointing uh, how few uh, RCTs, successful RCTs have been pre-age 
five and post age 16. I know the EF is addressing that. It's much more challenging, but <coughs> it's very striking um, how this approach has not really had as, as, as big an impact in that for those other age groups. And then finally, more, ch sort of more challenging, I say this as a fan of RCTs in education, um, there is a question about whether the huge public investment in the EF, I mean the DFE, um, you know, for all its faults, <laughs> put, put a really major investment in this, in, in this approach. Has that maybe skewed educational research too much towards RCTs? Um, and I absolutely agree with um, all the speakers who've sort of extolled the virtues of systematic reviews and uh, meta-analysis. Um, uh, they're cheaper than RCTs, but they're not cheap if they're done properly. I mean, <coughs> it's all the work that has to go <laughs> that Paul was talking about. I mean, that's not, that's not easy. A team of people probably working 24-7 on uh, analysing thousands of um, uh, 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 papers. But um, that is, I think that, that type of research is underfunded, but it's incredibly powerful. And other examples of research also, uh, we, we hope that they don't lose out because there's so much focus on uh, RCTs. Thank you very much, and perfectly timed. And, and now let me uh, pass to Professor Jer Jeremy Hogfield, who's a professor of mathematics education. Um, so um, I, I, I think it's been a, a fantastic day, and I, I, I do hope that this kind of conversation does uh, continue. I've got, I've got four points to make. Uh, my first point is about, is about funding and funders. Um, I've worked on, uh, I think, 15 uh, projects funded by the EEF. I think the EEF have done a fantastic job in changing how we see research and what we do. But there is a problem. The EEF dominates. It dominates not just the RCTs, it dominates our educational, our, our, our educational funding. And that's a problem. It's a problem because it then translates into a narrowing of the kinds of research that go on. So we need a multiplicity of funders. And that's not just the, the Nuffield Foundation. Actually, we need the RC UK and the ESRC uh, to kind of step up to the plate. And it's, it's great that they've now funded the Loughborough Centre led by Matthew Ingalls and, and uh, Camilla Gilmore. But we do need more. We need, we need, we need a building of capacity and we need our, our research councils to see their job as different. We've looked across the world at, uh, at the US. What hasn't been said is that the National Science Foundation have a different <coughs> mission. Their mission isn't just to conduct research, but it's to develop curriculum materials, which isn't part of our ESRC's, our ESRC's mission. Uh, secondly, uh, we need coherent and long-term research programs. Now, uh, Joseph just mentioned early years, and we've, we've seen from various presentations issues about, about the lack of early years research. I'm currently conducting a review for the EEF of early years in Key Stage 1. It's true that there's less research in the early years, but there are some really, really strong programs of research that we could learn from the Building Blocks program, um, the, uh, the work on linear board games, the Roots TA um, uh, uh, initiative. All of those involve a move from theory building research to proof of concepts to various sizes of, um, of, 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 um, of, of, of trials. And in fact, many of them use the same measures which uh, uh, allows kind of comparability. Um, we do need fewer trials, but we need better trials. Third point is about implementation. Most EEF trials fail because of implementation, not because the central idea is wrong. And we really, really need to understand implementation better, but also professional development better. Um, in, in, in order to figure out how we, get, um, how we get initiatives into schools and how they become acceptable to schools. We also need to go to trial with things that are ready for an implementation. And many of, many of the initiatives that are, that are trial are really not quite ready. <coughs> they're not manualised, they're not described well. 
Um, and fi finally, we've had a lot to challenge of small things. And uh, that re raises a, 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 a number of real issues. Many of the effects that we're interested in are small. So we've, we've, we've got to crack that nut in some way. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll end on uh, just, just, just to emphasize that a lack of st a statistically significant effect does not prove that something doesn't work. And so we've, we've, we've got to really understand what doesn't work. And I don't think we really have got to that position yet. Thanks very much. Thank you. And our final con panel contributor is Dr. Rita Hoffman uh, from the Faculty of Education at Cambridge. Thank you very much. We've had various talks about the challenges um, of RCTs today, many of them reiterating some same key points. And I think that for us to address these challenges, we build silos between different types of methods, RCT and other, at our peril. I have throughout my research career been involved in both RCTs and qualitative process and content analysis. And sometimes being involved in these two kinds of research has at times felt like the friendship between Jess Phillips and Jacob Rees-Mogg, if anyone's been reading her new book. But what I was really pleased to be hearing about today is that we've kind of moved beyond defending RCTs to a hostile audience who thinks they shouldn't exist. And we're all saying these are really honestly the challenges that we think we have. Here are some solutions we already have. Others, we might know where to look for them, although we don't have them yet. And I think it's been a really fruitful conversation. And in terms of drawing on other types of methods, including qualitative forms of data to improve RCTs, I think there are three key areas to which that can contribute for RCTs. One of them is recruitment and retention. The other one is implementation. And the last one is outcome measures, including, as someone mentioned earlier today, the measures by which we might actually want to try and capture implementation fidelity. But I want to particularly focus on implementation because I think, as was mentioned by the panel and as has been mentioned throughout the day, implementation is absolutely key to finding out more through our RCTs. If we have poor implementation, we don't know if our, if our intervention didn't work, which is the challenge that we have. We often have had the issue that the implementation ends up when we have a process analysis looking exactly like practice as usual. But also implementation, as has been mentioned by Alex and others, is really key for scalability, subsequently of interventions that have been shown to work. And so, I think one of the key things we've been hearing about is that challenge, but what we need to draw on is other forms of research that tell us more about the mechanisms of change in education and practice and the nature of the barriers to that change. And we've heard that many RCTs don't even have a theory of change, but we also heard that even when they do, more often than not, that theory of change is descriptive and doesn't draw on actual theory of the mechanisms by which practice in classrooms and schools might change. And I see this a lot as well in the trials that I advise on. We have theories of change that tell us the action which is going to be taken based on which change is expected to happen in school, such as a CPD session. But we've got plenty of evidence to show that classroom practice is not changed based on CPD even when teachers want that change to happen. So I wanted to draw on three findings or directions of research from our own research, which are supported by other research in the field that are relevant here. One of them is that ultimately implementation happens in the moment-to-moment -moment decisions that educators make in the classroom and in school, and not in the big thinking. And it is in those moment-to-moment -moment decisions that the intervention has to connect to what are the problems of practice that teachers feel they are addressing at that very moment. And I'm happy later on to provide re examples and concrete research what I mean. But this does not mean that we need to change our interventions to match to those problems of practice that educators face in school, but that we need to be able to identify what the link is and explicitly communicate that to teachers and school leaders. Secondly, we need to get a better understanding of the barriers to change in education and practice. And there are two things here only that I wanted to mention. Firstly, contrary to what we often tend to say, there's a lot of research to show that encountering contrary evidence 
to our current assumptions as educators does not lead to change in practice. Because that's not how practice changes. What research shows that much more systematic engagement and collaboration around that contrary evidence is needed for change to happen and that those opportunities need to be built into our interventions and the theory of change that informs them, such as the associated CPD. And the other aspect is that if our interventions don't address the underlying classroom norms that inform practice, then change will always remain superficial. And in some ways it's even worse because it will make it look on some process analysis measures as if change has happened and then it looks like our intervention wasn't successful because we get a small effect size, whereas actually what's happened is an appropriation of the intervention to existing practice on all other than the most superficial measures. And finally, we need to pay more attention, something I've heard less about today, so I wanted to raise it in the end, about innovation risk. Risk is involved in all intervention, very, very key to medical trials. We don't always talk as much about it in educational trials. We need to build into our trials a system that takes into account the accountabilities that teachers have in their practice and tools that help them address those. We need to take into account what teachers see them as themselves as accountable to and provide them the self-evaluation measures that they can implement during the intervention to make sure that they know their children are not coming to harm and that their schools are not going to have harmful effects. And I think those need to play a more central role in our interventions to improve implementation fidelity. That's what I want to share for today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Over to the floor to ask questions. And the back. Thank you. Uh, I'm going right. to take one or two questions and then allow the panel to answer whichever of them it takes the most seats each member. Uh, right, okay, so uh, in, you know, sort of time-honoured honored traditions of these sorts of sessions, I promise this will be a question, but it might sound like a statement to begin with. Uh, I recently spoke at Research Ed's national conference about the problems around research design, and everything I've heard this afternoon really confirmed that what I was thinking about that. Now, this is the thought that it's put in my head for the first time, really, this afternoon. I wonder if there's a skill set missing and the skill set is people who are able to work between research design and the real pragmatic world of what happens in the classroom. Uh, and I just wonder to what extent you would, you would agree with me that there's a kind of, there's a skills gap that often leads to those flaws in research design. the pipeline of, of EEF trials um, and the need for um, you know programs to be ready for trial and a lot of that's to do with implementation um, and I just had a question about to what extent you think there's a role for EEF in that or whether it should be other organizations um, and, and there was also just another another point which is that we have a limited lifespan um, but actually we have recently um, had some discussion with our trustees about continuing past 15 years, but obviously there's going to be a question around the funding for that um, and what that looks like, and just whether you had any thoughts about EEF post the 15 years. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not really used to this community of researchers in the UK. And I'm really fascinated by the struggles that you're facing with implementation on what seemed to me to be really quite specific, should be fairly straightforward to implement programs in schools in the UK. And I'd, I'd love to hear more about the challenges that you're facing on implementation and whether it is connected to this issue of skills transfer. And my second thought in that one is in relation to what EEF um, is thinking about doing in the next eight years and whether or not there's research that can be done around these processes of implementing, um, whether we can think about trials to understand different pathways for implementation uh, in different programs, as well as trials to think about different use of um, the research findings that EEF has. I'll pass to the panel to choose whichever one you'd like to, to answer and Yeah, I mean, a couple, couple of points. The, the gentleman at the back, I, I didn't catch his name. You make a very good point, but I think some of that is addressed through what I was saying earlier about 
sort of pre-RCT trial development, which naturally will involve uh, working with practitioners in the development of that program in a two-way. That's how that skills gap, which I think I, I see where you're getting at. That's how I think the best way of addressing it is, rather than sort of introducing a new cadre of person who's come up through, a lot of those people have come up through teaching, a lot of researchers in, in education have come up through teaching practice, but I think it's the, that collaboration before RCTs that, that is, is, is quite crucial to that. On the point about um, the sort of future of the EEF and whether EEF should, um, I think the EEF already does uh, extend some of its funding outside of the main RCT uh, model and does do some, in a small way, some funding of, uh, of, par of pilot work um, and obviously does a lot of work on synthesis as well. Um, I would say it's probably a good idea for the longer term future of EEF if it does diversify a bit. I still, I, d I don't think you can rely on other funders, um, whether partly because they're smaller, um, to um, plug that kind of er earlier gap. So uh, I also think that would link on, to, you know, imp improve its longer term justification with the future government who's thinking about it. I mean, one real surprise uh, about EEF is how hands off the DfE has been and there is a question about whether that might be the case with a, with a, with a future administration making a decision about making that kind of investment. I think you need a multiplicity of funders. I think you absolutely need that. Uh, uh, the EEF have um, emphasised the independence of the evaluators. If you don't have a multiplicity of funders, you, do, you, 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 you kind of lose that independence. You become two party. Um, and I mean, it would be odd that uh, a work, work centre disappeared after 15 years, wouldn't it? It would be really odd. Uh, just to answer the, the question about the, the skills gap, um, we don't understand implementation well. I don't think we understand it well in school, and I don't think we understand it well as researchers. Uh, but what we've got to do is we've got to find ways to talk across that, to talk across that boundary. The, the work that the EF have done on, on, on theory of change is a, is, a, is a good step in that direction. Uh, on, on almost no project on which I've worked on has a developer completely kept the theory of change then. So there's, 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 there's a real issue about, about, about keeping to the theory of change, but there is also an issue about testing that theory of change. I don't think we've put enough money into that into that evaluation to figure out what, what, whether the theory of change is actually describing what, what, what the mechanisms are. So what you're really talking about is the implementation of the implementation, not having high fidelity in delivering the programme. But I think the first question and the last question, or part of the last question, are partly the same. So you talked about can we do research and implementation, and is there a skill set missing that's relevant for that research? And I think we absolutely can. Uh, do research and implementation and we do that research in, in, in my research group all the time for example as do many other people and I certainly would challenge the idea that implementation challenges are particularly big in the UK um, certainly in the US where research programs are often much larger in terms of funding so they can actually combine very close a process analysis with large-scale evaluations um, they are finding exactly the same issues at very large scale as well as small scale um, I think it's important that we are developing that skill set for people in between and I think there is a good new funding streams that have sort of been initiated but they're very small scale now, moving from ESLC grants to um, um, impact acceleration account grants to try and start developing that skill set. I think what would be a huge, great next step if we had the loop back, if we could say we've got large scale studies that combine multiple methods, then we have an impact study and then we can move back from the learnings of that to develop both the theoretical pathway and the skill set back to the next more academically orientated study. I think that would be a fantastic um, development. And certainly to do that research and implementation, we absolutely need both the process analysis, we definitely need theory so that we know how does that process relate to any other setting than the one that I've looked at when I've got a qualitative data set, but we also need the RCTs. We need them beforehand to know where the gaps are and we need them afterwards to see if our theory of implementation is actually a correct one. So we need another loop there. Okay, I've got one at the back. 
I, I guess this uh, comment um, relates to implementation as well and the challenge of that. Um, nothing's explicitly been said by any speakers today about this, although I think it's been implicit in almost everything that everyone has said, and that is how you foster cultures of inquiry in schools. Um, and I think uh, what Rika was saying sort of made me think of this in, in that, um, you know, when she talked about implementation happens in the moment by moment and the issue about um, uh, um, uh, innovation risk, particularly in a culture of extreme accountability that schools are having to uh, live under. Um, so something around I'd be interested in that the, each of the panelists re responds to um, how you foster a culture of inquiry in schools. It does relate to the skill set that, uh, that uh, a previous questioner raised, and it relates also to you know um, are there are there individuals and leaders that sort of straddle um, uh, the boundaries between um, you know research and RCTs and uh, um, and, and school and the day-to-day -day of schools. and diversification and, and this question of implementation is that actually that is a big focus you know, we fund 32 uh, research schools we help develop training we develop partnerships around the country not just with research schools actually just as much emphasis in the next steps of the EF are about high quality implementation and support of, of you know, fidelity and all of these factors, all these challenges, alongside keeping that robustness and keeping that quality of RCT and then keep on evolving methodologies too. So actually, that is a, a huge part of our work. It's lit quite literally my job. Um, so, you know, talk up my own job, of course. <laughs> um, uh, I might add uh, an observation that throughout this afternoon's session, nobody has actually shown an elicitation of prior opinion about the plausible effect size for any intervention. And so one of the key things that we do in clinical trials is elicit that prior opinion, not just from those who are proposing the intervention, but from the school leads and the implementing teachers who would be part of the community to whom the results should apply. And in schools, particularly secondary schools, but possibly also primary schools, you might experiment with finding out what the children think about a proposed intervention. Um, because part of implementation is whether things go down well with those who are delivering the implementation and those who are in receipt of it. Uh, so that our prison-based trial the prisoners thought it was a great idea and that helped to ensure that the governor signed up and that he got his security chief to sign up to the fact that we were introducing needles into the prison, which normally they don't want to do. Um, and, and so elicitation would be... Now I've got one other uh, question to, to read out. Uh, somebody who doesn't want to reignite the paradigm wars, but would like to understand more about how the RCT approach acknowledges the beliefs, values, and personal professional qualities of individual teachers. As a medical statistician, I might say individual doctors, um, which, uh, for this questioner, are not simply variables, but which fundamentally constitute teaching healthcare as a pedagogical relationship, as a doctor-patient relationship, a mutual interchange um, in often non-replicable circumstances. In other words, the individual doctor, the individual patient. So it's not a, it's not a new question. Um, it is a, a familiar paradigm uh, in different disciplines. So I think I... Like you're, you're relating it to um, clinical research, I do research in addition to schools also in medical education. And I wanted to draw on some of the examples on that side to the three questions. So firstly about the individual participants' beliefs. I think 
it's often about differentiating two kinds of impacts. There is firstly something that we newly established could do harm. And it's very important, regardless of individual teachers' beliefs, that we stop doing those things. That's one thing. Might go back to somebody who made a comment about corporal punishment earlier on. Certainly, some people, when it was abolished and shown to be harmful, some people still very much believed in it. Then there is a different thing between a variety of things, all of which might have some benefit, between which practitioners could choose. So we might think of depression and swimming in very cold water. Wouldn't expect a GP to drop every single person with depression into the lake in the winter, but it might help some people. So I think it's differentiating between harmful impacts and positive impacts, and the latter prevented have a choice. Um, similarly, in terms of the plausible effect size for specific trials, and I'd like to go back to um, Jeremy's and others' point earlier about the relevance of effect size mentioned earlier as the only measure. You know, so we look at, again, in, in medical settings, for example, we don't just say, can we cure someone? We look at, for example, quality-adjusted life years or other measures. It might be that we get someone who's a tetraplegic only to move their lip or one of their fingers. We might not get huge effect size compared to thinking about the whole body, but they might then be able to communicate. We might extend someone's life by only some weeks. That might consider to be a relevant impact. So we need to think about when does a very small difference actually really matter and when does it not? And finally, to the first question about innovation risk. I'd again like to take it back to my research in medical education and again thinking about there are two different types. So we found that when we talk with specialist trainees, specialty trainees in medicine, they were very, very risk averse. It's a very high accountability system. They are all very, very concerned about ending up in front of uh, the General Medical Council. And when they took part in clinical leadership development, they all thought, I can't try anything, everything's risky. And then they learned to differentiate what they hadn't done before between risk to patient safety and personal or reputational risk from changing the way your team works and communicates, for example. And learning to differentiate really made it more possible for them to take risks. And I think that's absolutely true for teachers in schools as well. Thank you. Oh, I just want to pick up your suggestion because I was quite interested by that of soliciting um, sort of prior views from participants, um, potential participants, because I think that's very important when you start thinking about rollout, when you're, when you're marketing uh, interventions to, to schools of a intervention is successful, what they, what they think about it, having heard about it really briefly, is very important. The difficulty we'll have is that something like Magic Breakfast, which is a very straightforward, obvious, what it says on the tin, is going to be much easier to achieve that with than a more complex, like manualised intervention where you have to kind of do it to, uh, to understand it. But I think it's a, it's a really interesting model, which I have not heard of being used in educational trials, but I might, someone here might prove me wrong. I mean, there's, there's just a little difficulty there because if you if you ask both uh, both groups before randomisation, you kind of prime them. So there's 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 an, there's an issue about telling them much about uh, much about the intervention. Um, but we do look at. We don't tell them everything that goes on. Mm. We don't tell them how to manualise it. We don't tell. We certainly don't tell the kids very much about it. They know a little bit about it, so they might know that it involves revision, say. But it doesn't. It doesn't tell them what will go on in the lesson, and it's what go, goes on in the lesson that matters to them. I think. It's it, it yes, is yes. It, it's not it's it's really not mm. not straightforward without spending a lot of money with with other people yes. who are not involved in it. Yes. But but in the implementation process of evaluation, we do look at differences between between teachers, and we look at differences between between mm. between children. We may not have enough money to do it, but we do look at those things. I'm going to ask Ben if he will briefly. Uh, give thanks to a number of people for the day and uh, invite us all to the drinks. <laughs> and thank you to my panel. Who <laughs>